Now, this is uh, our 12th lesson, and I want you to jot down these seven things. I gave them to you last week, and then I'm going to have to really step on it because I've got about 16 things to give you in the next 35 minutes. That means I've got two minutes for each one. The seven basic needs that every child has, here they are. First, to be loved. I gave them to you last week, maybe not in this order. Next, to be disciplined. Loved, disciplined, accepted. Number four, to feel security. Number five, to be recognized. Number six, to be praised, complimented, encouraged. Number seven, to be taught about God and about salvation. Those are basic needs that every child has in a Christian home. I'll go the list again quickly. To be loved, to be disciplined, to be accepted, to be secure, to be recognized, to be praised, and to be taught about God. Seven basic needs. Now, let me say some things to you parents, and I'll say them. I'm not going to write them down tonight because I can cover the ground so much more quickly. And after this coming week, I'm going to prepare the outline ahead of time and just set it up on here, then you can see it. But here's the first thing. Husband-wife relationship is to have priority over parent-child relationship. Now let me say that again. Husband-wife relationship is to have priority over parent-child relationship. People that are going to marry and marry a mate that has a child needs to get that squared away before you get married. Husbands and wives need to realize that that relationship, aside from your relationship with Jesus Christ, is the most important relationship that you will ever have on this earth, and nothing else is ever to equal it. Your children will be gone one of these days. So you better keep the husband-wife relationship in its proper priority. So let me repeat that again. Husband-wife relationship is to have priority over parent-child relationship. And I feel I wasn't going to really say a lot here, but I feel that I need to emphasize there are some of you listening to me tonight that need to really assess yourselves carefully so that your relationship with your children is not stronger than your relationship with your mate. And if it is, you need to walk out of this building tonight determined by God you're going to repair that. Number two. The child is not to be the center of of all of the attention of your family. Let me repeat that. The child is not to be the center of all of the attention of your family. Now let me illustrate by making this statement. Don't be afraid you will be disliked by your child because you impose discipline. One of the reasons today that we're having problems, and I feel qualified to say it after going through what we have gone through in the past few years in counseling with hundreds and hundreds of young people, that too many parents have become afraid that their child will not like them unless they give them things. So we try to make up and buy their attention and by their love by giving them things, saying such things. Well, you've got more than I ever had. I went through the depression. 
You've got everything. You've got your own car, and you've got your bedroom, and you've got clothes, and you've got more food to eat. And if we're not careful, we keep wanting to buy and never discipline because we're afraid that if we bring strict, honest discipline, that we will lose our child. The very opposite is the case. That's what I mean by the child is not to be the center of attention. Number three, there needs to be a warning in the day in which we're living against pushing children into adulthood too fast, making them older than they really are. Sometimes you can see some little gal running around that's only two or three years old. It's already, mother's already got her all geared up to be a teenager. She's young in a short enough period of time. You better let her stay the little girl. Little girls step on your toes. Older girls step on your heart. And that's not only, it's especially true with girls, but it's not girls excluded or exclusively. Too often do we want children to grow up way too fast and expect too much out of them emotionally. And the way they dress and the whole bit. Number four, there's a lot of meat you can add in there I'll give you the guidelines and you put the meat on. Number four, your child will take on your attitudes and your spirit. Saints, let this preacher talk to you out of my heart for a little bit. You want to be careful what kind of a spirit you manifest, particularly as it relates to the things of God. Your church isn't perfect. God knows your preacher isn't. You need to thank God you only have to listen to me. I have to live with me. You can get up and go, and i got to stay with me. Pray for Sister Pano. But all too often, and you see it as the children grow up, the spirit that we manifest can come forth through our children. And sometimes they can be affected, of course, by outside. We all have had this experience. But we need to guard our own attitudes and our own spirits. And we need to be very, very careful about what criticisms we give. Because we can give criticisms and then we get over it because we've got all the fact. But we've undermined so desperately their relationship to the things of God and the things of the church, that we wonder why they have no respect for God's people. Many has been the young man that has come and the young woman that I've talked to over the years as a pastor that have said after they have wandered away from the church and have said have had nothing to do with the church, then something happened to their life and they've come back. Many has been the person in my lifetime that I have heard say, do you know why, Brother Pino, I didn't come? It's because I heard so much in my own home about everything that was bad that I said I wanted nothing to do with the church or God or anybody else. I just lived my own life. And now when I'm in trouble, I know I really need God, and I'm sorry that I had to go through all of that. For everyone that comes back, you believe this preacher, there are hundreds of them out there that will have nothing to do with the church because of the attitude of the parents. We need to be careful when we're talking problems that our children are not hearing the negative. Because the church will get along and it'll still be here. Jesus himself said, I'll build the church. Gates of hell will not prevail against it. But that thing can be so insidious, it'll be your child that'll be lost. 
I got news for you. I'm going to make it to heaven regardless of what any of you say. Got that all settled. Got my ticket. Got it paid for. Stamped. Valid. Glory to God. But we've got to be very careful. We've got to be very careful. Oh, underline it. Your child will take on your attitude and your spirit first about yourself, then about others, and then about situations and spiritual matters. You can read in most children the attitudes mom and dad has. There are always exceptions. Number five, plan for your child to help with family responsibilities. Let me say that again. Plan for your child to help with family responsibilities. It takes time. Sometimes you can do it quicker if you just do it yourself. Sometimes they're in the way. Blessed is the mother that will let the little girl put her hands in the mix, mess it all up. Just be sure that we keep the responsibilities fair. Let's pause for a moment. It's one thing to write it down, but parents, let's ask ourselves the question, what do I expect out of my children as a responsibility in the home? And if I've got more than one child, is it fair what I'm expecting? Analyze it. Stop tonight and ask yourself the question, is what I'm demanding fair and right? I had a little girl come in last week and she burst out crying and she shook all over. Her parents don't come here to church. And she said, Brother Paino, it's not fair. I'm a slave. She's only 16 years old. And when I inquired to find out if she was just uptight, and I began to do some checking, and I checked with her school, and I checked some other places. I found out that it was unfair. She has a father who is an alcoholic, has some brothers who make demands out of her. She does all the cooking. She does all the house cleaning. She does all the wash. She does all the ironing. She's only 16 years old. She's doing it all. Now, what's just as bad, I would rather for us to make the sin on that side than to make the sin on the side of doing nothing. For every one that's overworked, there's about a hundred that's not doing anything. So if there's some little gal out there today and mother's asking you to, you to do the dishes, you're not overworked, honey. Just smile. I'll tell you, dishes even go better when you smile. There were eight kids in our house, and us boys had to take our turns doing the dishes. My brother and I used to flip over who was going to wash and who was going to dry. I used to like to wash because you get done quicker. <laughs> Number six, listen carefully. Encourage your child to express their opinions. Don't ignore. Listen. Listen to what those kids are saying. Because if we don't listen when they're ready to talk, when we want to get something out of them, they won't talk. You know why? Here's what the kids say. When they're ready to talk and we don't really listen, we sort of grunt, or we don't really pay any attention. Then when we want to know and we start asking questions, they psychologically say to themselves this. The only reason they want to know now is because they just are wanting to get information out of me. They're upset, and they clam up and say nothing. They're not really interested. They've got an ulterior motive in wanting to know something from me. That's the reason the line of communication has to be kept open. Let's talk about it. Encourage your child to express their opinions. Number seven, give your children choices. Don't make demands. If
It's like the fellow that said that he had a dog that always obeyed him. Because when he spoke, he would say something like this. Fido, you come here or stay there. Not a good illustration, but how much better it is to give a choice. You could do this or would you rather do this? What do you think about this or this? Now, I refer to my own mother, godly, praying, spiritual mom. She's in heaven. But when I'd grown up, my mother was a little fiery gal about this high. And she didn't give you choices. She said, do it. And there were eight of us. She was top sergeant. Boy, she barked. She meant get with it and she had a backhand brother that could just jar your teeth the little gal down here you know us great big old husky guys she'd do something and we'd sort of fool around and she'd go bang she's i said do it you say well that was wonderful but i can remember my feelings i was angry I was resentful. I didn't swear because I had too much teaching to tell me not to, but I said everything is close to swearing as it could. You say, well, you made it. Well, I made it in spite of that. Mother, if you're hearing me, I'll be there. You say, aren't you honoring your mother? Yes, sir. I'm just trying to be honest with you. My dad was just the opposite. My dad would say, Dad, son, what about this? I've seen some of you come in because one of the best said, Party over there. I seen some of you come in, you had smoke coming out of your ears. I could see, oh Lord, help them now. Help them to pray through. How many know what I'm talking about? Huh? Well, listen, just because they're only that tall, that doesn't mean their spirit's any different. Give your children choices. Number eight, spend planned time with your children. There's there's one word there that's a real key. Plan time. Let me tell you why it's important to spend some planned time. It's because all of a sudden the child realizes that you really want to be with them. You've planned it. The reason I encourage families to take vacation. You never hear this preacher stand up here and tell you not to go on a vacation. Thank God for every one of you that are faithful. We had whole families to stay over from vacation to be in the musical before they'd even leave. Real loyalty. But this preacher always, never have I ever intimated, because if you can get away with your family, that's some of you ought to go to camp. Spend four or five days up there walking around in the trees and on the boat and standing on the bank of the lake and in the services and eating together and cooking marshmallows out on the fire and putting them between chocolate cookies. Oh, that sounds good. And I hate camping. (laughs) 
God's asked me to do some strange things in my day, I'll tell you. Spend planned time with your children. I was on the airplane today and was delighted to death. There was a great big six foot two fellow sitting in front of me. And, and, and he had a, a little gal. She's about that tall. I'm going to guess that she was maybe eight or nine. And then a little guy over here. I'm going to guess he's about six or seven. And he by himself. Now, the reason I knew because I overheard him talking right in front of me left this morning on the airplane and took both kids to Chicago and kept him with them all day, and now he's flying back. And those kids were so excited. But I heard him say, and I can't use all the language he used. He was from Fort Wayne. I, I didn't know him. But he said it, and you have to imagine all the other additives he put. He said, I don't know if I'll ever do such a blankety-blank thing again. He said, I am worn out. They were, Dad this and Dad that. And Dad, don't forget this surprise. And Dad, didn't we have a good time here? Now, he was worn out, but those kids, they weren't walking. They didn't even need an airplane to fly. They were flying in that airplane. Oh, God help us to see. Number nine. Compliment your child and encourage trust. Listen, I want all the kids that are here that are eight years old or above, wave at me. All the kids eight years old or above. All right, listen, kids. Don't expect your parents to trust you. Kids, look up here. Don't you look away from me. Don't ever say to mom and dad, you don't trust me, because they don't. And they shouldn't, until you've earned it. you got to earn it. So parents, when you tell them to do something and they do it, encourage them. Because you'll build trust and confidence. Don't criticize them. And kids, I'm talking to some of you bigger ones. Why don't you let me have the car? And why do you call? You don't trust me. I shocked my boys years ago when they pulled that line on me. I said, you're right, boys. I sure don't. <laughs> Hurt their pride a little bit. That's good when you earn it. Now I let them have the car. <laughs> Once in a while. Number 10, be extremely cautious about three things. Criticism, embarrassing them, and making them an example. I didn't say you couldn't do it. I said be very cautious about it. Number 11, don't ever compare your child with anybody else because there's nobody else like your child. I don't know why you can't be like Johnny. And Johnny's mother is saying, I don't know why you can't be like Jimmy. And Johnny's just like mother and dad. Don't compare them with someone else. Number 12, be careful about asking a child, listen carefully, listen carefully. I don't want you to miss this. Be careful about asking a child to fulfill your dream. There are some dads that want their kids to be a home run king when the old man couldn't even hit the ball. glad I had a dad that said, son, I'll never call you to preach. If you can be anything else but a preacher, be it. I'm glad I can stand here today and say, I'm a preacher, not because my dad was. I 
I know a little guy, he's not little anymore, he's in college now, and that guy has suffered because he has a parent that has tried to make him an engineer because his dad was an engineer, and that little guy no more cares about being an engineer than he cares about jumping off of the Empire State Building. He most probably is going to be a mechanic, work under a car someplace. Say, well, what's the matter with that? Not one thing. Be careful about asking a child to fulfill your dream. Here's a hard one, but listen to it. Don't reject their friends. But you see, their friends aren't any good for them. If you don't reject them, they'll find it out a lot faster. If you reject them, they're going to defend them. And the more you reject them, the more they'll defend them. And then they'll slip off because they feel like they want that choice. One of the best ways in the world for your son or your daughter to turn away from some friend that is having a bad influence on them is for you to simply say, if they are your friend, mother and dad's going to love them. You bring them on over to the house and we'll have a good time together. Are you listening? Don't just write it down and say, oh, that's for someone else. No, 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 it's for you. Okay. Number 14, recognize accomplishments. I've been doing a little experimenting watching some very precious youngsters come to the preacher. And I suppose that the preacher got more Easter cards from little guys and gals than maybe anybody else around in the audience tonight. And they came to me. Some of them I know parents had something to do with it, but some of them I know didn't because they slipped and caught me someplace when there wasn't anybody around. And it was all handmade hastily. The fact is, one of them was made on the fly leaf of one of her songbooks. <laughs> I'm going to send the bill to Dad. And i got to be real careful now because just by acknowledging what a beautiful thing, hard telling what the next special day will bring. Number 15. Remember, love is developed. Love is learned. Love is cultivated. Love is not a gift. I want to repeat all of that because it is so vitally important. Love is developed. Love is learned. Love is cultivated. And if we want our children to give expressions of love, we must speak it. We must express it. We must put action to it. We must teach it. We must develop it. We must learn it. Now, that's true in our relationship with God. Love is a fruit. It's the fruit of the Spirit that must be cultivated, and it's true in the home. Spend time developing love. If you want a close family, it doesn't come accidentally. You've got to develop it. You've got to teach it. You've got to cultivate it. Some kids wouldn't dare put their arms around their parents. They'd be scared to death. Some kids would scare, be scared to death to kiss mom and dad. I still kiss my dad every time I see him. See, you afraid somebody's going to say something? I'm afraid they're not.
Number 16. Deal with resistance by doing six things. Now, let me explain what I'm talking about. How many parents here have ever had the experience of saying to you, one of your children, either as they were growing up or even now, John, Susie, Bill, I'd like for you to do this or do this, and they didn't do it. Have you ever had them just fall on the floor and kick their heels? Have you ever had them just scream and say, no, I'm not going to do it? Most all of us have had some form of that resistance, and all of us have had experiences with it in our own lives, if we'll just be honest. And how do I deal with it? I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll tell you. I had a Sunday school superintendent in the first church I ever pastored. I can still see old Lloyd Lewis just as though Lloyd was in church tonight, and he's been gone to glory for 30 years. But he had a grandbaby, and this grandbaby, when they'd bring this child to the table, if the, child, if the mother started to feed it something in a spoon, this, this grandbaby would stiff it up and scream and then hold its breath and scream until it, it, it'd pass out. And then, of course, once it passed out, you know, it'd, it'd be all right. And I, you know, I'm just a young preacher, and I can... I remember one day when this we were out to their home and this little, little old baby's just <laughs> And Grandpa said, if you'll let me, I can cure that. And the mother, this had been going on for weeks and weeks and weeks and she was so distraught. The mother said, well, Granddad, he does it again. I forget now it's a boy or a girl. It doesn't make a difference. I'll say it's a boy. I don't really remember. But if he does it again, do whatever you have to do. Granddad says, okay. He was a great big fellow, weighed about 300 pounds. He was sitting there next to his granddad. He didn't have long to wait. <laughs> Mother tried to do something out a little. <laughs> well, Lloyd just reached up and got a glass of water and went, You say, is that what you're recommending? No, no. May drown the little guy. But here are six things. Listen now, this is so very important. Listen. Number one, always mean what you say the first time. If you say, Mary, carry the garbage out, then don't yell it anymore. Walk in the room and get Mary by the arm and say, I said to you that you would take the garbage out now. <laughs> you say, why that? Simply this. Here's what most of us do. Mary, will you take the garbage out? Mary doesn't do anything. Honey, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> and Mary sits there because she knows we don't, you know, really mean it. And maybe she'll get by and not have to do it. And Mother will go ahead and do it anyway. A little bit later... Mother says, Mary, the garbage isn't out yet. Still nothing. And then a little irritation, and the mother says, I've about got everything cleaned up in here, and the garbage still isn't out. Now she's getting upset. And then one of two or three things is going to happen. Now the stage is set to really have fireworks, or the mother is going to say something like this, I just get sick and tired of it, and she totes it out herself. Now the whole groundwork's all set so that the next time she asks something, she go through the very same process. When you say something, or you give an order, or you make a request, mean business the first time. 
Number two, don't wait until you are angry to demand obedience. Because the child then psychologically responses, responds, the only time I'm to do anything is when there's anger. And so we are now creating a relationship where anger has a preeminent place in a relationship. So rather than being right, it's a response to anger. Don't demand obedience when you're angry. That's the reason it's important you mean what you say the first time. And then go do it because it's right, not because you're upset. There are too many of us that wait till our blood pressure hits 220 and our face is red and the veins are popping out and we said, I said, do it. I wish you could be a teacher because I just felt that hit all over the place. Just <laughs> Number three, don't compromise. Because if you start negotiating and you start compromising, you'll never be in control. Number four, listen parents, be sure dad and mom stand together in the request. Be sure mom and dad. Don't ever permit this. Mother said this, but Dad, if you will say this, Mother will change. Or, Dad, what do you think? Do you think it's all right if I do this? You better be finding out what Mother said first. Because when the negotiation starts... I'll tell you who's going to lose. It's not going to be the kid. Number five, be sure that you are reasonable. How many times have we made a snap decision and a demand and a request, then we had to back away from it because it was unreasonable? If you, do, if you don't do such and such, I'm going to make you do such and such that's completely unreasonable, and the child knows that you're not going to do that. If you're going to ground a child for something and they're old enough that you're going to say, I'm going to ground you, it's silly to say I'm going to ground you 30 days unless you're prepared to see they're grounded 30 days. Because if you say 30 days and compromise for two weeks, you started a negotiation scheme Every time there's a demand, the negotiation starts. Be sure you are reasonable. Number six. Tough. Believe me when I share these things with you that I wish I could give myself a passing grade on all of them. The reason I know some of the answers so well is because I flunked it. But a man has to be an idiot not to learn some things from flunking. Number six, and this is the last one. Show patience regardless of the behavior of the child. We never win the battle when we lose our spirit. He that can control his spirit can conquer a city. The Bible says. Be patient. I've been amazed at how often young people will come up balanced out when we adults stay patient. Now, those are two lessons that I felt like I wanted to share with you about children and a relationship in the home. And I hope as you go through these 16 items that you'll look at them and not just be hearers of the word, but doers 
of the Word. And there are some of the things that we've talked about tonight and shared with tonight that mom and dad need to have a little session alone on some of these things and say, hey, look, let's don't wait. Let's do something about this right now. Let's do something about it. And if so, you'll be amazed. We need to thank God we've come through a period of time where it looks like there are some real indicators that the home is getting stronger. The world out here is beginning to realize that there is nothing any more wonderful in this world aside from our experience with Christ than a good Christian home. And our young people are beginning to see it. And I want to give some real impetus to the movement. I believe it's God. And I pray that God will make our homes what God wants them to be. Can you say amen? amen. Let's all stand together. How many parents are here tonight? You'll lift your hand and say, Brother Pano, as we were going through these things together, there were some areas where the Lord really spoke to my heart. May I see your hand? Praise God. Praise God. Husbands and wives, reach over there and put your arm around your partner. Don't hold hands. Put your arms around one another. God bless you. I want to pray for our families. Precious Lord, there are mothers and dads here. In some cases, there are single parents here. And as they are raising their children, they need your wisdom. We know that you can take the circumstances of everyday life and produce real spiritual strength in lives and in hearts. So I ask tonight, that where there's been problems and where there have been mistakes and where there have been wrong decisions, that you'll bring healing. Lord, we felt impressed of your blessed spirit to teach on these most important matters. And as we grow and go on through this year, as you should tarry and we get into even deeper, desperate things, grant us wisdom. Send people out so that our homes can be the strong bulwark that you intended them to be. Lord, there are those that have got some real difficulties and the devil's got in and taken advantage in some of these areas. So I take authority over his power tonight and I ask that there be a sweet healing that husbands and wives and mothers and dads would feel closer together than they ever have. And some of the parents, Lord, where there's come hurt and brokenness in the home. You give that parent that has the responsibility real direction. You said you'd be a father and you'd be a mother. And I'm asking you to make up, Lord, where the lack is. And we'll bless you for it. For I've asked it in your name. Amen.